Good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Stoner. I'm the Mossbacher Director of the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law here at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford. And I should mention that you are sitting in the Freeman Spogli Institute right now, and some of you may not even have known it. It's my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's program on behalf of the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. Uh, Rule of Law. Our speaker and discussion this, discussion this afternoon are here under the auspices of the Arab Reform uh, and Development Program here at CDDRL. And the program's focus is on the social and political development in the Arab world and has had a long standing role, 15 years now, I'm told, in bringing to the Stanford community scholarly informed discussions on pressing questions about governance and social and political change in the countries of the Arab world. I'd especially like to um, thank Dr. Hisham Alaoui, who I saw come in, but he's hiding out there somewhere. There he is in the front row, um, who's in the audience today for serving as one of our key partners and key supporter for the ARD program, as well as my friend and colleague, Larry Diamond, who will moderate um, today's discussion. And also huge shout out in back of the room to Dr. Hisham Salam, who is the Associate Director uh, of the ARD program. And also, I'm happy to say, my Associate Director at CDDRL um, for research. Thanks also to our terrific staff, um, Nora in the back of the room in, in green, uh, Nora Sulatz and Amy Whalen um, for their superior organization and communications about this event. And it's wonderful to see the room so full. Now on to our speaker and how our program will proceed uh, this afternoon. Dr. Salam Fayed is an economist and former prime minister of the Palestinian Authority. He also has served in many international uh, organizations, uh, for example, with the International Monetary Fund, um, where he was from 1987 to 2001. His tenure included serving as the IMF resident representative in the West Bank and Gaza Strip from 1996 to 2001. He then served as manager of the Arab Bank in Palestine in June of 2002. He was named Minister of Finance of the Palestinian Authority. Until he resigned in December 2005, Dr. Fayed served in that capacity on several cabinets, introducing in the process extensive financial reforms in the Palestinian Authority. In January 2006, he ran for elections on a slate of independence and was elected to the Palestinian Legislative Council, where he served as chairman of the Finance Committee. You probably think I'm going to go all the way back to your birthday, but I promise you I am not. <laughs> we're, we're heading back into, into the early 2000s. Um, in March 2007, Dr. Fayed was appointed again as Minister of Finance in a national unity government, and in June 2007, he was appointed Prime Minister, uh, a position he held until he stepped down in June of 2013. In August 2013, Dr. Fayed founded Future for Palestine, a nonprofit development foundation. And currently, Dr. Fayed is a visiting senior scholar and lecturer in public policy and the Di uh, Daniela Lipper Cools 95 Distinguished Visitor in Foreign Affairs at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, formerly the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. He's also a distinguished statesman with the Atlantic Council's Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security, and a distinguished fellow at the Brookings Institution. Dr. Fayed holds a BSc from the American University of Beirut, an MBA from St. Edwards University, and a PhD in economics from the University of Texas at Austin. I want um, to add that uh, you can see Dr. Fayed speak again tomorrow in Stanford's Democracy and Disagreement series with another um, Freeman Spogli Institute visitor in our Israel Studies program, uh, Dr. Alan Tal, who's seated in the back of the room. That will be at 3 p.m. in the CIMEX uh, Auditorium at the Graduate School of Business. I think their discussion tomorrow, as will our discussion today, um, be both enlightening, and I anticipate that, especially tomorrow, but also today, um, the discussions will model civil and civic uh, conversations about very difficult topics. Um, I thank Dr. Fayed and Alon Tall in advance um, for taking on this important task as well. So leading the discussion today 
with um, Dr. Fayad will be my friend and colleague and literally right-hand person uh, right now, uh, Larry Diamond, um, who is the Mossbacher Senior Fellow in Global Democracy and one of my predecessors as the Director of the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. Um, before Dr. Fayed and Professor Diamond come on stage, however, I was asked to say the following, a quick word about format. I am to alert the audience in the room that, as you no doubt have already discovered, um, there are note cards and little golf pencils um, to write any questions you would like to pose to Dr. Fayad. Um, they're not for your golf score, it turns out. Um, one of our staff members will collect these cards. Just hold them up when you're ready during the session. Um, we won't take verbal questions, and um, so you'll notice there are no uh, microphones. In keeping with Stanford's policies, I'm also directed to say, should we have any disruptions in the room, and I don't anticipate that will be any, um, that um, to our staff in the Office of Public Safety will first warn those disrupting the proceedings and are then authorized to ask that they peacefully leave the room. I hope again, however, and I trust that this will not occur. So um, that's all from me, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Uh, Fayed and uh, Larry Diamond to the stage. Uh, well, I want to begin by saying just what an honor it is and a joy to be in the presence of and to be in conversation with this wonderful man, this spirited intellectual, very popular teacher at Princeton, from what I hear, hear which is, uh, you know, another great educational institution. And uh, really, as I think most of you know, and it's probably one of the things that brought you to this room, a really quite important historical figure who I think um, has a historical uh, mission that is not yet fulfilled. Um, so, uh, Dr. Fayad, welcome. It's Go great ahead. to have you at Stanford. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin with the uh, obvious and huge question. Um, you've long favored the creation of a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. In other words, a two-state solution. And we'll go back in time and talk about uh, what you did to try and bring that about. And I'd like to, over the next 40 minutes or so, explore how, if at all, uh, it might be brought about. But first, I'd like to ask you why. Uh, many people, uh, even some who once favored this as a resolution of the conflict, now question whether it's still feasible. So um, do you still favor a two-state solution? And if so, why do you think that's the best and most promising pathway? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Larry, for hosting me. Thank you all for your interest. Uh, thanks, Stanford University. And let me say, see if I can remember the acronym CBDRL. Yeah. Uh, how about that? And, and also program on Arab reform and democracy for making this possible. Really happy to be in, in your company. Appreciate the interest. Of course, we meet against the backdrop of very, very difficult and trying times for, for all who, who follow developments back in the region, in particular in Gaza, obviously. And we, at some point, will get to that. Uh, not before I first address the question that you posed to me about solution concept that became known as to say solution. One of the problems, and, and I'll speak to that in terms of where I stood, where I stand today, but one of the key problems is that it became known as such as a concept, but it is a loosely defined concept, and it meant, obviously, different things to different people. And part of the reason, in my humble opinion, why the process failed is that because there were differing perceptions in terms of what, in fact, the PLO had in mind when it accepted to sign on to the Oslo Accord. Uh, it was the promise of statehood in what became known conceptually as to set solution, but statehood where on the territory Israel occupied in 1967, West Bank and Gaza, including East Jerusalem, essentially. That basically is was the promise uh, of Oslo. And so when people say two-state solution, that's what it meant to our leadership at the time. And that's how people generally understood it. And by the way, there was a period of time uh, 
five-year period between 1988 and 1993. That particular period was very interesting in one important sense, given our long you know, history and, and, and struggle for freedom, for being able to live as free people with dignity in a country of our own over many, many decades. That five-year period between 1988 and 1993 witnessed the largest extent, greatest extent, largest degree of national consensus on, on a goal made possible, in my humble opinion, uh, on the strength of the spirit of the First Intifada uh, of uh, 1987. That made it possible for our late leader, Arafat, to, in 1998, stand up in Algiers and say, in the name of God, in the name of Arab Palestinian people, the Palestinian National Council declares the establishment of the state of Palestine at the, at the time. And that session of the PNC, in fact, in addition to that which was said then, adopted something that's called Palestinian Peace Initiative, which was about accepting United Nations Security Council Resolution 242. There was a major kind of turnaround, U-turn, if you will, in the history of the national movement, Palestinian national movement. It started, its genesis goes back to the mid-70s, when it, the PLO was first for the first time signaled willingness to accept a solution on the territory Israel occupied in 1967. So that's what it meant to Palestinians. That's what it meant to the leadership. That's what it meant to the very large number of people who took to the streets when they had that historic speech by President Arafat at the time chairman of PLO from the diaspora in, in Algiers, welcoming it and, and all of that sort of thing, realizing the day after the extent to which that represented a concession relative to our narrative. So it was a major, major turnaround. But the promise, the promise was, we're going to really get a state. We're going to get state on the territory Israel occupied in 1967. That was not really clearly defined or understood to be the objective on the Israeli side. That's my assessment, you know, just going through the history of negotiations and what led to Oslo and how Oslo was constructed, structurally speaking, uh, the content of it, the high degree of asymmetry to it. Clearly, at the time, Israel into, went to disagreement, of course, to those who did not wish to see any solution along those lines. It was also a big deal, but big enough to where the center of gravity of the body politic in Israel was not willing to accept to enshrine in the Oslo agreements something that said this process shall culminate five years later into a sovereign state of Palestine on the territory of Israel occupied in 1967. So it was something, but not quite what we, what we, the Palestinian side kind of perceived this to be about. And I have to say also with the Palestinians, by and large the international community. I mean, I don't think the United States at the time playing the key role it played subsequent to the signing of the agreements anyway, and the balance of negotiations, discussions, kind of entered into this thinking that there will come a point in time when the Palestinians were going to accept a state of leftovers of the West Bank, for example, uh, something akin to what was what ended up being called as the Trump peace plan in 2020, which was about a Palestinian state on 70% of the West Bank, for example, for example. So I don't believe, you know, there was much space between where the Palestinians were on the West Bank and the international community, on the other hand, on what the outcome of that process was going to be. And, and so that's what it meant to us. It obviously was not what, what was anticipated or accepted. Maybe there are some in Israel who at some point would have been willing to live with that outcome, but they thought it impossible, kind of uh, 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 maybe more practical to kind of let us see where it, it leads us, but it's no coincidence that the agreement did not say anything about Palestinian sovereignty, Palestinian statehood. That was problematic. That was problematic. So what we really have left today, when we say, you ask me the question, are you for state, two state solutions? Say, what does it really mean? Because in fact, what is enshrined in the Trump peace plan of 2020 is technically speaking, it was a solution concept. It talks about Palestinian state. And it talks about the other state that has existed for more than three quarters a century now, namely the state of Israel. So technically speaking, in a technical sense, it is a two-state solution. But it is, is it anywhere near what we Palestinians could conceivably consider acceptable? And the answer is obviously not. 
I mean, if something that is even better than that was on offer before in previous rounds of negotiations was not deemed as adequate in terms of living up to our national aspirations and expectations, certainly something in the nature of 70% of the land mass of the West Bank, not to mention lack of sovereignty, by the way, not many people really took note of that, but that's the reality. That was called the two-state solution. So am I really for that kind of solution? The answer is obviously not. I am more aligned with where we were back in the late 80s, so to speak. I was part of the majority that, that thought this process was going to culminate in the establishment of an independent state of Palestine on the territories that were occupied in 1967, alongside the state of Israel. So it fits the billing of being uh, uh, part of the, the construct that's two-state solution. But two-state solution was not really defined with with adequate precision. Obviously, part of this is to be expected if something is going to be the product of negotiations. It, it stands to reason that the contours of what the exact solution is going to be are going to be left to negotiations to determine. One key problem that we faced, and along with us, the intermediation internationally and all of that, was that this ended up being negotiation about principles. And in my Opinion, you know, negotiations ought not be about principles and narratives uh, and all of that. Negotiations ought to be about arrangements, about assurances, but not about principles. So you want a two-state solution, meaning a state alongside the state of Israel, well and good. What is a key organizing principle that could determine, you know, what that state of, of Palestine is going to be as part of that whole geography? It made sense for that to be defined as the terrorism, territories are occupied in 1967. Does that mean that there can be no negotiations on border of state? No, it doesn't really mean that. So in brief, let me tell you, I am for that solution. I promise you to give you a, a position, my own position on this. Provided that any quest for that outcome going forward, given the terrible experience of the past three decades of failure after failure after failure, to where not many still invest in that concept anymore, on either the Palestinian or the Israeli side, to be honest with you. I think for the benefit of all, that process must be preceded by formal recognition of our right as a, rights as a people, our national rights. It's very important. Oslo was not about that. Oslo was very transactional. Oslo was a framework within which the PLO, acting on behalf of all Palestinians, recognized the right of the state of Israel to exist. And you are here in centers of democracy and capacity building and institutions and, and, and statecraft and all, you know the difference between recognizing the existence of something, which is the norm in international relations, and the, the, the recognition of the right to exist. This is a, a profoundly higher order of or, or form recognition that to the best of my knowledge does not exist, never existed, anywhere in the history of international relations. This is the kind of recognition Israel got from Palestinians back in 1993. And what did we get in return? Recognition by the government of Israel, of the PLO, as the representative of Palestinian people, to which I often said big deal. It was a big deal, of course, from Israel's point of view, because it conferred a lot of legitimacy and imparted weight to recognition by the PLO of Israel's right to exist. So I'd say, Going forward, and this is a conversation that is now uh, coming back to the fore, particularly after October 7 and the ensuing war, which still rages on as we speak, that there must be a path to a two state solution. And I'd say, okay, provided that the mistakes of the past be completely avoided, the lessons learned, and one of the key lessons learned is that it's a mistake to engage in a diplomatic process that is not defined well in terms of outcome, you know, what it is supposed to lead to, that it is not based, particularly from our point of view, on recognition of our national rights as a people, because so far we have gotten none of that. So if a process like this is preceded by the kind of recognition of our rights, something which, given the experience over the past three decades, would, would suggest is necessary, then yes, for sure, and I, like many Palestinians, I believe, would find it 
then reasonable to engage in a process that could take us there in, in agreement and through negotiation. But to continue to say, you know, two-state solution, two-state solution, in fact, it ended up meaning nothing. It ended up the expectation of us to be happy with any crumbs that are thrown out at us, any leftovers, and for us to be called or thought of as totally ungrateful if we say we back to differ. No, sir, I'm not in that space. And I don't expect any Palestinian to be in that space. That's not a happy place to be in, not only from our point of view, but I would submit also from the point of view of all other countries in the region, including in Israel, if all are interested as they must be for the benefit of all in the region to live in peace, prosperity in a, in a sustainable way. The process has to be really calibrated. It has to be more principled than it has been so far. So if that's what we're really talking about, I'd say yes. If we begin with that. And I think until we get there, uh, it's important for us to really begin to attend to, to attend to the task that is most pressing right now, for sure, A, to see the war come to an end, and to begin to, as soon as possible, to deal with the terrible you know, aftermath of it. And for that to, to happen, the war first must stop. And that's absolutely essential. That's something we may get an opportunity to talk more about, but I think it's an essential and, and, and critical point to begin any conversation with on the Palestinian question today. I want to come to uh, the current conflict uh, and the uh, uh, extremely painful and devastated state of Gaza today, but first I want to complete yeah. a little bit this conversation reflecting on the past and the concept of a two-state solution. You mentioned asymmetry. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask you two questions. Um, first, um, can you reflect on the asymmetry that has always been embedded, I think, in Israeli assumptions or in Israeli approaches to thinking about a two-state solution whenever there was dialogue about it? that a Palestinian state would have to be demilitarized. That is, that Israel wouldn't feel secure uh, with a Palestinian state having, let's say, a, a conventional army. Uh, and second of all, is there any other aspect of asymmetry beyond what you've noted and the uh, issue I just mentioned that you want to surface here? Yeah, there are a number of aspects, actually, and, and dimensions and manifestations of, of asymmetry, key amongst which is the one I mentioned, the structural component. And it's huge, given that this is really a lot about uh, two diametrically opposed narratives, for sure, on our side, on Israeli side, in terms of who owns the title to this land. You know, for us Palestinians, our ancestral land, and for Israel, for Israel, it's land of Israel. I mean, that's the starting point of analysis. So I keep saying that that's really the most important manifestation of asymmetry, the structural component. Because if you really think about what was done in 1993 in those terms, specifically and technically speaking, it involved recognition on our part collectively represented through the, Palestine, the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, of Israel's right to exist, not existence. Right to exist where? In land that we Palestinians, in our narrative, consider our ancestral land. In return for which we got just what we, I told we got, which is recognition of PLO as our representative. Not recognition of our right to a square inch of the land. So what does that really mean? This is how dramatic this was. This actually means a major concession, basically, kind of accepting, which I don't think was meant, the superiority of one narrative over another. And that's never a good point to begin a conversation that's aimed at getting to a piece that people can live with sustainably. That's, that's key. There are other aspects, but they are not. This, this first one is unique to us in many ways, given the, the history of the conflict. But there are other aspects of asymmetry that are not kind of unique to Palestine and Israel. You see them everywhere in terms of power relations. You see them everywhere, in all facets of life. You see them on college campuses. You see them everywhere. So you have that. And, and you know, it's incumbent on people to really find a way to deal with them. Uh, whether you are the party with the power or the weaker party, uh, 
I subscribe to a, a way of thinking that you know, basically, it is, please don't misunderstand me. It's not that I really don't see the, the wrong that is the occupation. It's not that I, you know, I live it, I understand what it is, I relate to it. You know, oppression is never or anywhere acceptable. It is not normal. It shouldn't really be internalized as something that people can live with or expected to accept. Just because a state thinks it's not secure enough. Well, you've been around, if you're Israel, for more than 75 years. You, you built a strong, vibrant economy and country with a strong military and all of that sort of thing. So to deny a people the right to self-determination, which is a right that is absolute for us under international law, just like any other people anywhere in the world. Read the Declaration of Establishment of the State of Israel in the way that it related to the right to self-determination when it so said explicitly. Like all other nations, it said, well, we are one of those other nations, and we are as entitled to the exercise of our right to self-determination as any, any, anyone else. That's very important. So insofar as security is concerned, this is something that I think can and must be discussed, and it really has to be a part of what, what, what parties to an agreement can discuss to the point where, again, I said negotiations are about arrangements and assurances, but not about, not about principles. Just because I have a sense of security about something, it doesn't mean that forever I need to really go continue occupying and oppress forever because I have a sense of security. I'm not belittling that. It's important need. Don't get me wrong. A state that does not fend for the safety and security of citizens is not worthy of being a state. That's a key responsibility of the state. I understand that. But the answer to this is not the continued oppression and subjugation of other people. Maybe you need to look at the root causes of this conflict and understand that there must be a better way, not only for us Palestinians, but for others. That said, I also believe, just as it is, you know, for the oppressive and highly capricious occupation, which it has been for us, for sure, important to kind of do some introspection and, and, and look at this and think it through thoroughly. It is equally important, if not more important, for us Palestinians to understand, just because we are the weaker party in this uh, uh, balance of power, does not mean that we kind of really wait until the justness of our cause, which is the just cause for sure, you know, gets us home. We must actively assume full agency in the act of our liberation. We must. Yeah, we are the victims for sure, but we should never really continue to think that somehow we're going to really get to where we need to get by continuing to claim ownership and monopoly over a victim of corner. There's a lot to complain about if you're Palestinians, and I often say there's a lot to cry about, especially these days if you're Palestinian. But that by itself is not going to deliver us. The freedom that our people deserve, the freedom and the dignity that many of us died and continue to die, and certainly nothing that really rises to the aspirations of those people, or our people, or our younger people and all. We must assume it full agency in that act of liberation. That's what we must do. You get that going. What does it really mean? If we want an entity, we should invest in actually invest, I mean, totally you know, in, in, in projecting this reality on the ground. And I consider that to be the highest form of resistance in the face of oppression and occupation. You, if you, if, if there are some who really think that somehow this is something that needs to be postponed forever because it suits them politically, or genuinely they really feel somehow it's going to be a threat to them, there is no better antidote to this than us Palestinians doing what is absolutely necessary under any scenario. If a state is what we want, the most important act of getting there is projecting its reality on the ground. Occupation is not going to make it easy for us. I know I served in government. What I was doing besides trying to do precisely that. It's not easy. And a lot of people were skeptical about that, kind of really almost kind of describing it as an exercise, exercise in the impossible, like a Sisyphean task of sorts. But I never really understood 
Sisyphus to be an exercise in futility myself. You learn something every time that boulder rolls back on you. It's, it's really about empowerment. That's what it is. It's most inspiring to try, even if you fail. Even if you know you're going to fail, you learn from it. You learn from it, and you keep pushing that boulder up the hill, up the hill. There will come a point in time when the stars will align for that which is just, but that day will never come unless we, Palestinians, before anyone else, assume full, agents, assume full agency in that act of liberation. And that is the sense in which I don't believe you know, our freedom is Israel's to give. I don't really think about it this way. I don't see the word this way. Our freedom is an inalienable right, and it's an inalienable, it's, it's an inseparable component of us as human beings, as human beings, as members of human race, like everyone else. And we have that to share with everyone else. You have that kind of recalibration. You have a conversation that begins from recognition that there are parties to this, two parties to this, that are dealing with it from the point of view of parity. Not the oppressor, not the oppressed, not the master and the slave, not the master and the surrogate. We are all members of the same human race. We have the we have same fears, we have same anxieties. We have the same uh, sources of what we think are, are worthy pursuits in life. And, and surely there is enough room for everybody uh, there. In, in the Middle East as elsewhere. It just happens to be the case that this is a, a part of the world that is old. Um, there's a lot of history there. Um, and there is a lot more that can be said about this. I get this feeling at times when I'm, you know, travel around this country, sometimes even go on walks and in parks and, and things like this. And uh, think of maybe sometimes you take a little bit of a step to the right, step to the left away from the main trail, and you think you, you're the first human to have set a foot there. It's kind of unique, given my own background, where just about everybody, anyone, given their history, has taken a stroll there. Uh, more difficult to settle conflicts you know, there than it is elsewhere, for sure. Not impossible. So, um, yes, I want to uh, invite you now, even though we're only about 30 minutes into our program, if you have questions that you've written out on your card, good. I'd like this section to pass it to your uh, right, which is my left, the middle section to pass it to the right, and, the le and this section to pass it to your left. Uh, and the reason why I want to do this now is that um, uh, our second moderator, uh, my colleague, Hisham Salam, needs some time to aggregate them together. And please understand that what we found is that if we use this method and we have a moderator who can pull questions together, make them concise, aggregate them, we can just get more questions in. We, we can do better justice to our speaker. So um, let's turn to Gaza yeah. and this painful the difficult subject uh, of this war. And I want to first give you a chance to reflect on this tragedy. And second of all, ask you, everything you've talked about was challenging enough on October 6th. How have the last uh, seven months of a devastating terrorist attack and um, a war in Gaza that has leveled much of the physical infrastructure of the country and claimed, I don't know, over 30,000 casualties, it's very hard to know. How does that uh, change the dynamics of what you're talking about and make it even more formidably difficult? Or where do we go from here? Yeah, it, it certainly has made it a lot more difficult. Uh, and it did come and happen against the backdrop of many beginning to feel that, you know, maybe this is not the worst of situations to be in, given the long history and contentious history of the conflict. People are starting to move on. For a long period of time, the going thing was that you can't do much in the Middle East unless you resolve the Palestinian question. And many, including Israel itself, were beginning to feel comfortable with the idea that you know, time to move on, and you know, we can normalize with the region. And some of that was beginning to happen. 
and there's some conversation. There continues to be about normalization with Saudi Arabia as well, with the number of those agreements happening before uh, and all. So it appeared as though that's where things were. Uh, history should have actually been more of a source of wisdom on this than, than uh, it appears to have been the case, which is that um, injustice cannot endure. And you know, ignoring problems is, is not you know, solving them. You know, the fact that something is not you know, constantly on, on the news or something like that does not mean it, it, it has gone away. Uh, and I invite you to really actually look at how we Palestinians uh, are viewed by some uh, uh, Israelis and, uh, and, and actually even for the establishment of Israel uh, thinkers, those who influence a lot uh, uh, political thinking in, in Israel itself, how they really viewed us, you know, uh, the Palestinian Arabs, the Arabs, etc. Uh, that it was naive to actually think of us as people who are going to really just forget and move on. Because really, that was understood on the part of, of, of some, including in what became Israel after 1948. That's, that's true. So there was that you know, going on. There was uh, the reality of. Uh, uh, a lot of focus on the West Bank. Actually, if you recall now, people forgot after October 7, given what happened October 7 itself, and then the war after October 7, people now forgot, but they had not forgotten on October 7 what things were like in the West Bank. Because for the better part of the previous year, most of the occupation, the, the preoccupation was with the West Bank, not Gaza. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the Third Intifada, you know, erupting. And all of that was in reference to the West Bank. Not Gaza. And why is that? Because of extremism, settler violence, and all of that, and raids, and, and what have you. And there was a lot of interest in this. A lot of people were talking about it, and then October 7 happened. And, and then that shifted. It, it, it was totally jarring and disorienting to Israel itself in, in the way it happened for a variety of reasons. I personally spoke to this on a number of occasions. And it, it, it's clear, you know, what, what happened that day, a major shock. But what was clear, at least to me from early on, was the response to it on the part of Israel was not going to be, not likely, it was impossible for it to come close to attaining objectives which the government of Israel set out for itself early on. You know, ranging from eliminating Hamas, eradicating Hamas, and along the way, some expressions leveling off Gaza, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I thought that the objectives set out for, by the government of Israel uh, ranged from the very beginning, from the completely impossible to the extremely unlikely to be attained. I gave examples of that. And if actually you look at the weakest of the formulations of those objectives today, namely this large Hamas from government in Gaza, well, here we are, you know, six months into this, more than six months into the war. And from all appearances, it looks like Hamas is still in, in control of Gaza, even if in terms of governance, in terms of governance, not that there is a, a functioning government, but in the sense of, you know, for certain, it looks like if there is a lulling activity, or once the war comes to an end, you know, surely Hamas is going to be in charge. Their police is still operating. They are involved in aid delivery. There is the sign of police activity here and there. So by any you know, objective assessment, it appears as though the weakest of those formulations has not been attained uh, six months into this. But what was obvious equally, if not more, that in pursuing that objective, in pursuing that objective, it was certain that tens of thousands of Palestinians are going to really get killed. And even if that you know, satisfied some instinct or whatever need there was, on the part of those who make decisions in, in the state of Israel, even if it did, they clearly were not attaching enough weight to the potential for that kind of attempt to attain objectives which are unattainable to turn into a strategic liability and strategic defeat. Something which Secretary of Defense of the United States, Lloyd Austin, you know, those were his words, you know, early on, many months ago, he said that much. And I think what we really have seen you know, around the world subsequently in terms of, you know, people first, you know, expressing a lot of sympathy with Israel, uh, 
uh, on 7th October, and the immediate aftermath of 7th October, even demonstration that you really, now people kind of see images of demonstrations in, 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 in Europe and the United States supporting Palestinians and all, but some of you may have forgotten, but it really actually happened in many places around the world. There were demonstrations in support of Israel. You know, that, that truly happened. People res re respond to what they see. But there's no human conscience that collectively is prepared to accept 34 plus thousand Palestinians killed, many of whom children, clearly non-combatant, total destruction of, you know, infrastructure, housing, homelessness, and displacement, and all of that as a reaction to something under a goal which clearly is impossible, plus, you know, highly unattainable to really go out and, and produce this outcome, the strategic defeat and liability that Secretary Austin was talking about is, is in plain sight for all to see right now, for all to see. And as much as I really would like to see the war come to an end today before tomorrow, it's imperative to do that. And even if collectively, so we'd like, I'm sure, and many in Israel as well, would like to really see this happen because of the misery that is Gaza. But there's a lot of interest in really seeing this come to an end because Israel has own interest in bringing it to an end as well. Is there going to really come a point in time when somebody puts a foot down and says, enough already? It's, it's way overdue for that to really happen. And so for people now to really, you know, kind of look at symptoms uh, by way of reaction to uh, what's, what's going on in Gaza, and, and we, we need to resist the protests and we need to do something about this and, you know, ignoring, you know, why or how this whole thing came into being. That's just really very short-sighted. It's not the right way to go. And I'm actually here just to be explicit and specific. I'm talking about like a, a student protests and in, encampments and expressions of discontent with, with policy and all of that sort of thing. And I think, you know, that's a, reac that, that's a normal reaction. That's the normal reaction. What else would you expect? And, and the longer this goes on, the more difficult it's going to really become for everybody. I would say for Israel itself as well, not only from the point of view of people, our people in Gaza and, 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 and throughout the region as well. So uh, I know a lot has been said in, by way of, of documenting the extent of damage, but I'm telling you, uh, looking at it as a Palestinian and what, what I really see as our own priorities. You started the conversation by asking me about two-state solution and how we resolve the conflict and all. These are all important questions, but I, I think the most immediate task cannot be for a very long period of time, uh, cannot go beyond doing all that we can do, beyond the work, stopping to lift ourselves up and deal with the misery, with the, with the sort of psychological term and the, the deep wounds this, this, and scars of it that's going to leave us with for generations to come, generations to come. 650, 700,000 students without schools or anything like that. People cooking grass for, for meal and, and something like that. Facing famine. And, I mean, how can, when, when people are not, you, they're talking to you now, they're not sure they're going to be around when you talk to them tomorrow morning over the phone or something like that and going through this. Deep scars of that, total families completely eradicated, eliminated from the uh, 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 population register, completely. I mean, that's just not easy to deal with. You, you, anyone like he's standing up talk about like a future and two states and solution and, and all of that. And I need to remember to say something to you about two states as well to really close that circle. But before that, anyone who really is in that space, not starting with this, they're not really seeing the reality for what it, it must be seen as a reality. But in addition to it being necessary and important, I think it could also be, you know, our springboard to, you know, that, that national project again. There we rise again, from underneath the rubble, from underneath the ashes, the misery, the death, the injury, the suffering. There we rise again as a people, desirous of being recognized as, as equal to everyone else. Not superior, but certainly not inferior to anyone else. We're all human, wanting to live in peace and wanting everybody to live in peace, security, and dignity, and, 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 and fully pursuing what they think is, is is desirable from their own point of view and being respectful 
of the earth and willing to live with the earth and, and, and share that space uh, and all. But that really has to be the, the starting point of analysis. The one point that I really wanted to make as I was really responding to the question on, on two states, uh, because there has been a debate about this. In, in fact, up until October 7, which is ironic in some ways, there are many people who kind of really uh, seem, seem to me to be in a rush to outdo the other guy by saying how impossible it is for two-state solution to materialize, that it is dead, it's more dead than dead, and, and all of that. Uh, I myself use that expression, or I was made to say that in a, in a title of an article. It was not my choice of title, but it was evidently the sense of what I was saying. You know how these things go. But in any event, after October 7, and you, you saw the transformation in Israel in the wrong direction in terms of really not wanting to see Palestinian state and all. And you see the war, et cetera, then all of a sudden people are really talking about two-state solution again. Uh, I said, maybe if we had this conversation a year ago, you probably would not have started the conversation with it. I don't know, maybe you didn't, you would have. But, but it's back there, people are talking about it again. Uh, but I remember that when people were racing to outdo the other guy by saying how impossible it was to continue to pursue this pipe dream, that's to say solution. Oh, then, therefore, one state solution. Let's say, like, a, as if de facto, if it's not two states, so for sure there's going to be one state solution. Uh, that, I think, is, is, is not a really good way of, of looking at it. If you really are pursuing, seriously, uh, an agenda of national liberation, if you are Palestinian, it's not, uh, because that's not, we have been living uh, what might be called uh, one state reality, uh, a reality which I think there's enough within the camp in Israel that's not desirous of seeing any kind of Palestinian statehood, not even Palestinian authority, continue to exist as a Palestinian political entity, um, to really continue to run the show for a long period of time uh, as a reality that, in their view, is sustainable. I mean, how many times have you heard international uh, diplomats, serious senior diplomats, I don't want to mention names, this is a public event and all, you know, lecturing uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu about how impossible it was for Israel to be both Jewish and democratic at the same time if it continued to hold on to the territories it occupied in 1967. And I used to kind of say, how naive do they think that Netanyahu cannot do arithmetic? I mean, it's like they don't, don't <laughs> What's the point? I mean, he needs to be lectured in terms of demographics. I mean, obviously he could. I mean, he knew the demographic friends, but they did not stop for a minute to think that he may have a different solution concept or a non-solution concept, if you will, in mind. And that's what was really and has been unfolding for a long period of time. This one state reality. You say apartheid, what apartheid? You have Palestinian authority. We have, if I had my passport on me, I would have showed it to you. We have passport, we have a flag. That's what he would say. We have a, 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 a political body that represents them. They are there, we're here. So under what guise are they supposed to participate in a political process in Israel to you know, run for office or something like that? That's the kind of reality that we're looking at. If, if some you know, harbor thoughts about that being um, uh, the solution, that's not the solution, that's the reality. And that's not a workable reality. Certainly one does not fulfill our aspiration being able to live uh, uh, as free people in, in a country of our own, it doesn't. Now, I'm not going to really take issue with the concept that says, you know, one state for all, equal rights and all of that, something conceptually, I mean, in, in, in democracy and, and all of that, why not? But, but that's not on offer. And just because the, the quest for Palestinian statehood stumbled, in, in the within the framework of two states living side by side does not impart automaticity to one state solution. I just you know want us to really be clear about that, uh, and and, uh, and it's important for us to really stay focused and and not lose sight of what's going on. To think of what's going on as a solution that's acceptable to Palestinians certainly isn't. All you have to do is just basically look at what is happening to us, what continues to happen to us, and what is likely to continue to happen unless you know, there is a, a, a solution that's agreed at some point. Well, um, I have a number of other questions. I feel like um, uh, we could go on, you and I, for several hours here, 
I have absolutely no doubt you would have the energy for that. Um, but we promised uh, to uh, give uh, half of the session to the audience, and Hisham Salam has uh, done his best to integrate those questions. And so, Hisham, you take it from here. And then I'd like one as save time for me to ask one question at the end. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You don't even have to ask. Uh, well, I want to reiterate uh, and echo uh, what Larry and, uh, and Catherine mentioned earlier. It is uh, such a great honor to have you with us. Thank and you, uh, we really cherish and uh, appreciate uh, the fact that you came all the way here to give us this op rare and unique opportunity uh, for uh, engagement, uh, to learn, uh, to deliberate critically, especially during these uh, very difficult and very pressing uh, times that we're actually experiencing. So I got about 42 uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so we have a lot of questions to go through. Advanced apologies uh, if we don't get to every question. The good news is about half of them are about the same question. So uh, oh. we're going to save a lot of time. So therefore, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into it. Half of the questions are talking about the role of Hamas in a future Palestinian state. Yeah. What do you what role would you foresee to uh, for Hamas in a future Palestinian state? Uh, and the other uh, comment that is usually the question was followed by was the fact that um, if a Palestinian state includes uh, a role, a political role uh, for uh, Hamas. Uh, as an armed uh, movement, uh, that that would actually uh, pose a threat to Israel's security. A lot of people have been uh, making or did make the comment that uh, over the past decades, whenever, uh, at least, and I'm quoting here, whenever uh, uh, Israel has ceded land to Palestinians, uh, the consequences was more conflicts, more rockets, et cetera, et cetera. What are your thoughts? Thank you. On the first question, first, you know, Hamas, its role in governance of Palestinian authority, in Palestinian state, Palestinian politics. And, and then I'll deal with the second issue uh, about military or militarization dimension. First, on the question of being a part of the system, regardless of which component of the system we're really talking about. My own you know, perception, and it's something I wrote about shortly after October 7, reiterating in the process things that I had said for a number of years before about a way in which you know, Palestinian polity can be united and the way in which it can be made inclusive, as it should be, as opposed to the way it has been, especially after 2007. And I say especially after 2007, because actually the split or the rupture in the Israeli body, in the Palestinian body politics started before 2007. It started literally on the signing of the Oslo Accords. Immediately after the signing of Oslo Accords, you know, opposition, some on grounds of principle said a number of things of the kind that I said now. It's like, why are we doing this? It's not right, etc. Of course, Hamas back to differ from the very beginning. There were attempts at including Hamas in the PLO early on. And I'm aware I was not close to the system in any way. I mean, I was not within you know, the political system. At the time, I was an international civil servant. Uh, and uh, I'm aware of the fact that there were attempts made at trying to include them in the PLO. Mm -hmm. And they were you know, made an offer to join the Palestine National Council, which is like our parliament in exile, so the most important body that produces the executive committee of the PLO, which is more like a government of the Palestinian people, there was an offer made to include them in that parliament at large, same body that convened in Algiers in 2000, in, in, in 1988, when uh, Abu Ammar gave the speech again. So uh, they didn't accept, because what they were offered at the time, as best as I understand it, uh, was 40% representation in the council. Uh, and they wanted more. That's uh, interesting. Uh, they, they were offered, I'm sorry, they were offered 30%. They were offered 30%. And they wanted more than 30%. And in Palestinian body politic, if you're Hamas, you get 
So you need a lot of independence to really join forces with you to really have a, a majority. I mean, that, there was that kind of really thinking about it. There was an attempt made at trying to really do it. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. They wanted more. It didn't work. Then there were several rounds of dialogue, actually, in Cairo, you know, taking place. And the person who actually led the Palestinian or the PLO delegation to us is our current president, Mahmoud Abbas. And they agreed on, on forming a, a body that's uh, called Unified you know, Palestinian Leadership Framework, which would include factions like Hamas and, and Jihad in the broader uh, forum that has at its core the exact committee of PLO, but then it has representation by Hamas and everyone else. That didn't work out very well. It, it became dormant even before it was born. And the PLO could continue to run the show by itself while excluding you know, others. For a number of years, it was clear that this model is not sustainable. Why is that? Because the PLO has lost much of its credibility and standing, primarily because of the failure of the bet it made on Oslo in 1993. I mean, 1993, you know, the agreement, every, people were supportive. By and large, for the same people who are supportive, I told you that period of time people are supportive of the transition that the leadership made uh, and the transformation of the program and all of that sort of thing. But when they realized year in, year out, that the dream of freedom and liberation and statehood was fading away to the point that by the time when it was supposed to happen, there were not many people who thought that was going to happen anytime. And with the expectations gap actually becoming wider and wider and wider in the mission. It's natural. If you stand on a platform like this and you make, you make a bet of the kind the PLO made and then you don't succeed, then it's not a kind of, of the problem like you're, you're having a bad day or headache. This is a failure of a doctrine. So in politics, you lose. I mean, you lose massively. And that's what happened. So Hamas, there was ascendance in, in its standing. And since then, you know, coupled by, you know, misrule on the part of Palestinian authority, unhappiness with governance and all, that produced an environment of discontent, which made Hamas a, 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 a choice for a large number, for an enough majority in Palestine to the point where they got outright majority in the elections. Last time we had them, national elections uh, in, in, in 2006. I mean, I don't know if they still will get the same kind of majority today, but certainly it's significant enough for them to be considered a major political force, for sure. Now, you could try as hard as you would like to exclude elements from the system that you don't agree with or, or something like that, but what you produce is not going to be sustainable. It's not going to be sustainable. Uh, there is a part you know, Hamas has an ideology. It's a political movement. And, you know, that's the only way you can compete with an idea is with a better idea. And ideas compete and coexist. Sometimes, you, uh, at times this party wins, at times the other party wins. But at every point, the society has a responsibility, political society, of trying to manage its pluralism effectively. So I tell you what I really find, you know, Larry, uh, kind of problematic when it comes to issues of symmetry and asymmetry in the way we are viewed and what is normal and not normal, acceptable, not acceptable on our side, and what is not even discussed on the Israeli side. It's like, so you can't have peace so long as you have Hamas, you know, as part of Palestinian body politic. Well, who's having that conversation when it comes to the composition of the Israeli government? For example, what they really say about us, no one. Israelis elect their own leadership. I have nothing to do with it. It's their right to, it's their government, and they have a shot at it at least every four years to do that. They make their own choices. It's pluralistic political society. I don't like the outcome of elections in Israel, but I have nothing to do about it. That's the government they have. But no one you know, tells them you can't have elections or you can have elections only if you exclude this party or that party or the other party. So to me, it is is not a good point to start a conversation of saying in order for us to do business, first we really need to exclude these guys. I reject that on grounds of principle, to be honest with you. First of all, politically speaking, on grounds of principle, this is not acceptable. So somebody really needs to tell me 
in what way that is going to be workable if the face of opposition to the platform that has just demonstrably failed are going to be excluded and they happen to be you know the guys with the toys with the guns it's, it's just not workable so there is no question that you need to include them just as pluralism is a good thing and you promote it certain in programs of democracy development i'm certain and you don't say you know it's, it's good for the us it's good for israel it's not good for Palestinians. pluralism is a good thing that's not a question it's the responsibility of each people to really find a way to manage that pluralism effectively and there is a way to do that despite differences for the set of political scene i will not say offer some ideas that are capable of achieving that at the level of plo right now mm -hmm. at the level of plo and hamas are on record having said for months now they're willing to not be in the government itself but they want to be in the plo and i think that that is something that can be done and it can be done without the factions having to go to china and for reconciliation or to moscow before that for reconciliation if there is seriousness about that which i view as an absolute necessity hmm. which is palestinian unity that can be done half an hour over a zoom call you don't need to go to china or, or or russia for that or anywhere else or even to cairo you know what i'm saying you can do this if in fact there is the will to do it that's absolutely essential so i think that that much that part of it is okay in the scheme that i presented there are elections there is a transitional period during which you have a government that's non-factional just to avoid any kind of really uh, uh, difficulty in trying to reconcile everything all at once so you have a government that's consented to by the plo that's expanded that includes everybody that government then would have the political backing to go into gaza tomorrow that's essential that's an important instrument if you really want to see the war come to an end sooner rather than later. Because then those international interested in seeing the war come to an end sooner rather than later would have an instrument of pressure of government of Israel and say, we have a Palestinian authority acting through this government able to go to Gaza tomorrow. So we need to really wind this down now. But that has not happened so far. It's, it's, it's a failure. So there is no question of them you know, having to be included in the political system. My proposal is to include them at the level of PLO. They accepted that. They are on record having accepted that. Then there are elections after a multi-year transitional period. And then whatever people decide, people decide. And whatever the outcome of the elections, then we need to really have to manage it and find a way to actually manage it. In, in fact, the point that people say divides us on the Palestinian side, uh, of course, every party and every faction, they have their own values when it comes to sociocultural issues and what have you. But there is not really a whole lot of space between parties on basic fundamental issues of who we are as a people, our historical narrative or anything like that. There isn't, you know, that much there. So what is the difference? They say, oh, some of us have sold out. They accepted as a solution this conflict, a state on only the territory occupied in 1967, when in fact all of the land is ours. Presumably that's the debate. Now my point to all with respect is like, where is that state that you're really talking to me about? We've been talking about it for decades now, but there is no solution around the corner. And so long as there is no solution around the corner, why is it that we really have to settle this point of difference between us today? Why don't we really all unite in a serious way and engage in the one act that must unite all of us which is to engage doggedly in the task of projecting the reality of our own political entity on the ground in spite of occupation. We should do that. If and when Israel gets to the point of being willing to recognize formally our natural rights as a people, including our right to a state on the territory occupied in 1967, well, at that point, mm -hmm. then we turn around and say, brothers and sisters, you know, no time for ambiguity, any no time for ambiguity anymore. We now have to settle. We have this recognition by Israel. So we, we can't continue to have this multivision platform. We need to settle it. We settle it then. We settle it by referendum. We settle it by discussion. We settle it by debate. But to continue to be divided over something that's not even on the horizon. I mean, we've been, we've been in conflict over this issue for more than three decades now. And where is that state that we're really fighting about? where some of us view it as a concession, 
uh, relative to our narrative and all of that. It's not anywhere. Is it not wise? I mean, the Biden House cannot stand. I'm not convinced that we really can get anywhere so long as we continue to be divided, so long as our political continue to be torn by this very high degree of factionalism, you know, and, and rivalries in, in ways that have been extremely destructive. There's no question in my mind they have to be included. This is the process. You include them at the level of PLO. It can be done in half an hour. You can expand the PLO tomorrow. It can be added to the executive committee. Their role as executive committee of PLO, acting on behalf of everybody, is to collectively consent to a government which can go to Gaza tomorrow and begin to assume the task of managing the affairs of Palestinian people in the West Bank, Gaza. But those who are looking for a state on the territory of Israel, Israel occupied in 1967, if that is not going to include Gaza, there is not going to be a state anywhere. So it seems to be necessary first step anyway to really bring Gaza into the fold. Not to mention that it is compelled by the terrible situation that is there, given the war, given the devastation of it, what has been going on there for the past more than seven, six months now. I have a lot of follow-up questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to turn... To... By the way, I have time. Sorry if I'm taking too long to answer oh, no. questions. My fault. No, no, no. You're... I, I make it up. I'm, I'm, I'll be here for as long as you want. It's, uh, it's all good. Same here. Same yeah, here. Sorry. We have we have a couple more. No, I'm just kidding. The um, I want to turn to a set of questions that are actually asking about the situation here in the United States on college campuses. That's above my pay grade. Above... Yeah. But... Um, yeah. Some, I mean, some of the questions are definitely asking you more directly to comment about your own opinions and your own assessment of uh, the protests that are happening. But some of the questions are actually taking issue and um, expressing concern about the slogans that are being used, be it on college campuses, uh, be it in protests that are actually happening in the United States and in other countries as well. Uh, you know, one of the issues that people are raising is that they feel alienated by slogans like Free Palestine from uh, the river to the sea uh, and uh, and uh, apartheid. And my question for you, if you want to, if the question about the protests themselves are above your pay grade, no, no, is no. about the, no. uh, the specific slogan, Free Palestine, uh, as well as from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. What does the, what do these slogans actually mean to you in your own mind? And what visions for change and methods for change do you associate with these slogans? Thank you. Now that's within my pay grade. And I may <laughs> I may fail the test, but I'd fail it square and fair. When I said about my pay grade, you said you wanted to ask me about something in the United States. I don't know, the United States is above my pay grade. I don't ask a question about that. But on, on the protest, um I think I just said this uh, in a meeting that we had before. A lot of things are true and, and can be true at the same time, by the way. Uh, and, and the problem is sometimes people get fixated over one element of, of something and to the to 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 the extent of saying, you know, if this is true, then everything else must be must be false. And that's where you really get into difficulty. Look. I did refer in, in what I had to say to you at some point to this conflict being fundamentally a case of two diametrically opposed narratives. There's no secret to this. It's, it's obvious. Palestine is our ancestral land. You ask me about my own, my own view. I'll be very forthright and just tell you where I stand on this. I am a Palestinian who believes that Palestine is our homeland. That's our narrative. That's our historic, it's our ancestral land. Jews have the, the narrative that refer to the land as land of Israel. So clearly you're you're talking about a case here where the principles to the conversation, to the extent there is one, as there needs to be one between two competing narratives. But at the same time, there is a majority, I believe, or a majority can exist at some point, that basically says, yes, that is the case. It has been going on for such a long period of time. We need to find the solution. But by definition, that solution cannot be, you know, all A or all B. It obviously cannot be the case. And the idea of somehow, you know, finding a way to share the land is not new. It goes back to the 30s of last century. 
the, before the partition resolution of General Assembly of 1947. That's that's absolute true. It's very very well known. We know that. So when you have people, by the way, I passed by encampment here yesterday at at uh, at Stanford, and I didn't see anything but but orderly student congregation and people sitting around, you know, talking to each other. Appeared to be totally peaceful. And um, normally I saw some slogans uh, talking about things which you would expect students to talk about. I saw something similar on the campus of Princeton, uh, similarly. Now, specifically on you know slogans that are seen as an affront by the other side, and the other side being, you know, Israel, the other side could be the Palestinians. That's the whole idea, is to really actually look at this from both sides. There are some practical ways of dealing with this. Look, if, if you, I'm, I'm not here to adjudicate the case of, you know, who's more right. Um, you know, it, it, it's ours, it's theirs, and theirs, it's ours. But a slogan that actually stands in the face of from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free, as per se. I mean, the analog to it on the Israeli side in, the, in their own narrative, it's all ours. It's all ours. It's not something I fabricated. There is, there is, Israel has gone through a process that led to the adoption in, I believe, 2018 of the nation state law that basically said the right to self determination in the state of Israel is exclusively for the Jews. Now, you tell me, you know, if that is not, if, if you really go back to the genesis, of what eventually ended up being Israel in 1948, formally, the proclamation of the state of Israel. And the first kind of landmark in the internationalization of the Jewish people's quest for statehood was the Balfour Declaration, or at least a key landmark along the way. And what does it say? It talks about the right of the Jewish people being viewed sympathetically by Britain to have a homeland in Palestine. But what about the rest of us who are there in Palestine? How are we referred to? So on the one hand, there are Jews whose rights are recognized to a homeland in Palestine, or that is viewed sympathetically. But who are the others? Who is the other? The other was defined by who he and she was not. We're the non-Jewish communities non-Jewish communities, we are defined by who we are not. So there is no question that when this came into being, this came into being against the backdrop of an ideology that basically saw this land eventually as being state of Israel, a state that is at least at a minimum for a Jewish majority. That's a, there's no question about that. So you take something that Palestinian and Palestinian sympathizers are saying in, in isolation as if there is no analog or counterpart to it in the other narrative. That's just not true. Now, the very same people who say, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. If it is a statement of narrative, I just explain to you where I stand on this. If it is a statement that is about something, something more than that, in the sense of like a as, as it is often described as anti-Semitic, or this is about getting rid of the Jews and all of that sort of thing. I squarely re reject that. You know what I'm saying? There, there is no moral ambiguity here. There ought not be. That is not acceptable. And I think if you talk to students themselves who say that, I don't know if I really can say this for sure, because I don't know everybody. I don't know what anyone would say for sure. But I doubt that any one of them would say yes, I'm saying this because I hate Jews, and I want to see them all out of here. And if they did, that ought to be squarely condemned by all, no less by us Palestinians. The justice of our cause is grossly undermined, if that is how it is characterized. We refuse to be pigeonholed in that way. We don't hate anybody. We shouldn't. And we should be not hated or resented for standing up for what is right. And was just. That's how I see this, as simple as that. Beyond this, more generally, this is a 
a highly charged issue, a highly emotional issue. Be on this, I can say this. And if, you know, sometimes, you know, you give your right to kind of render some, something you think it's wisdom. Mm -hmm. It comes with age. Uh, I don't know if anyone is entitled to give anybody advice on, on anything. But I think it really helps, for sure. And it helps administrators and universities to think, not, not so much in terms of the rules and regulations uh, and all. Seems to me uh, an exercise in futility to try to regulate things. I, I think it's laughable at some level. It's, uh, I don't want to mention names, schools, or anything like that. It's like, what do we do about this? I mean, students are up and arms, they're unhappy, there's unrest. What do we do? So we say no in campus. Problem. There's nothing in the rules book that says no in campus. Oh, let's have one. So let's 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 have a rule that says no in campus. So say to have a rule today and it's enforceable immediately. You know, chill out. I mean, I don't think that's really the right way to do this. Uh, chill out. I mean, I don't think there's really much to really worry about. Uh, students have right to protest. Students are, are agents of change, uh, historically for the better. Uh, I think we are the cusp of um, an Arab Spring-like moment uh, in some ways. I, I find it most inspiring to be honest with you. Yes, the road and the journey from the late days of 2010, that's Tunisia, to where things ended in Belize so far, and your centers and program, I'm sure have done a lot of work on this and continue to do, did not really take the region to where it needs to go. But that rendezvous with justice will someday come for people throughout the region to be able to feel their respected citizens, their own countries, as simple as that. That's what I see students really yearning for and expressing. And, and, and there is nothing that ought to really be seen as threatening. But to them, I say with respect and deference, when it comes to students, you need to really be absolutely differential because they decide. To me, you know, schools are about nothing if they are not about providing the most propitious environment for students to pursue their own personal intellectual development, meaning learning, you know, learning. And, and you'll learn a lot when you actually, from time to time, you know, depart from your kind of zone of comfort and uh, your own, you know, identity group. You tend to congregate, whether it's whatever it is that really, you go to university, it's really time to, from time to time, take a peek and listen into what others say. It, it really helps. That's rule number one. You can't, you codify this. You can't have rules that, enforce, you know, force students to do this. Because I think it's a good thing. It, it really opens you up a lot. Secondly, you know, be for and against something. Don't conflate that with who's saying it. I mean, that really also helps kind of calm things down a little bit. Don't hate somebody for saying something that you disagree with. Disagree with what they say, but don't dislike them for and kind of take a personal issue with them this way. You calm things down. Rules cannot have much to do with this, but it's really more something that people arrive at. It's more like a code of conduct. It's, it's basic, basic manner, the basic organizing principle. Whatever happened to getting along pleasantly? Uh, this is a, a phrase, you know, old professors, God bless his soul, Wendell Gordon, an institutional economist, University of Texas, used to say a lot, getting along pleasantly. And, and, and uh, had many, many conversations, but not, not in this context. How can you really codify that? But it seems to me a, a good rule of thumb would be to learn that it's not that profitable or useful, or maybe even not good manners to engage in discrediting or undermining our people's view, other people's view of their truth. People are entitled to their own truths in the way they see them, their own narratives in the way they see them. But this cuts both ways. This cuts both ways. And it's the really wrongest of time when emotions are high to really engage in a conversation with the aim at discrediting somebody's truth. Even truth. I mean, Einstein is, is reported to have said, I don't know if he did or not, there's a, a debate about this. Nevertheless, I can't really like it. Uh, he said, uh, reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. It sounds like something he would have said, but, but there are stories that he may not have said it. But this actually, it, you know, has a lot of meaning to it in, in, in some way, if you think about it. 
in some way. So why not, if, if somebody says, this is significant to me, this is culturally, spiritually, politically significant to me, that's their truth. But I think it should be taken as such, accepted. You're entitled to yours as well. Comes the time people can discuss these issues, you get to a shared space. And the shared space that binds everybody is that sense of humanness. That's 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 the space that really everybody belongs to. You approach things this way. I mean, you cannot codify these things. It's more like a community creed, if you will. It's a culture. And if schools begin to be known for this, it can be a really good selling point for them to have more students. But if, on the other hand, parents are looking at their kids kind of being corralled out of uh, squares here and there on horseback or something like that uh, because they're demonstrating. Well, think of yourselves. Think of the times when you really took to the streets back in the 60s. I mean, the parents and grandparents of this generation, all of a sudden finding it so out of control. I just passed by the encampment, nothing. So it's all right, people. But it's very meaningful. It's, it's very meaningful. And I think it really, this is precisely the kind of, this is what I mean when I say things like this ought to be honored and respected, not resisted. People are expressing themselves. People really feel terrible about what's going on. They would not have acted or reacted against the backdrop of better or different conditions. They're reacting to something. Those feelings ought to be respected. And I think with enough space for everybody. And as I say, something is, 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 is viewed as offensive, just don't park it there. Move on. Uh, let's just stay focused on what this is about. There comes a point in time, you want to really talk to me about narrative, let's just talk about narrative some other day. But for now, if this you find really offensive you, okay, I will not say it. But, but I'm not here to really deny or explain away or be apologetic about, about something which I believe everybody anywhere in the world is entitled to, their own perception of the truth and their own narrative. That's basic. That's basic you know, component of really being able to live uh, 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 in, in, a, in a cohesive society, in, in harmony. Uh, this is about all harmonious existence. I think it's important. I tell you what is really the worst part of, uh, of it. Worst part is kind of speak from both sides of one's mouth. You you speak, if you are addressing an audience, you say something, you speak another audience, you speak something else. No, I, I think, and this is really important, you know, important role which educators have to play, administrations have to play. I think that we really need to be a little bit more principled and take a step back and, and think about this. And when you do this, you will find that people kind of respond to you. My last point on this, I'd say, you know, do not remember that you need to deal with needs of this nature only when there's trouble. Mm -hmm. There's ample time and opportunity. In fact, compelling reason for there to be much stronger interaction, particularly with students, throughout the year, in all seasons, in good times, you know, and, and, and talk to them, and, and, and et cetera. Because when things happen that are out of control, sometimes they do. It'd be much easier to for someone to show up and say, let's have a conversation, as opposed to having that conversation only when, you know, tensions are high and emotions are out of control, where you really cannot have any conversation with anyone. Okay, well, speaking of chilling out, I'm just going to go ahead and stop here because I think we have time for one short question, and I want to make sure that Larry Diamond gets his question, and okay. I'm going to give him the last word as well. Thank you. Um, this is a bit of a personal question, uh -huh. and I will confess that I'd forgotten that Catherine was going to introduce you, so I'd written out an introduction of you, and I noted that uh, you um, were so impactful as prime minister and as a state builder uh, that there was a noun that was termed uh, coined to characterize your approach to state building and it was called fayadism uh, and it was meant to refer to efforts our colleague frank fukuyama is going to love this uh, to build an effective state to reduce corruption to develop infrastructure and a market economy you're an economist. You've been characterized as a technocrat, a patient, technical, quiet state builder. I don't think anyone who has heard you here uh, for the last 90 minutes thinks of you as merely a technocrat. Uh, you spoke with and speak with 
incredible conviction and frankly, passion, which is what we think of as a leader of a state and not simply a leader of a government. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas is in his late 80s, I believe. Um, you know, some people think he may not be um, president of the Palestinian uh, Liberation Organization and leader of the Palestinian Authority much longer. Would you consider going back to Palestine to lead a state and not just a government? So that's a personal question. Is that, uh, oh. Within your pay grade, I hope. It is within my pay grade. And I, we had this conversation before, uh, and you were kind enough to ask me if there are questions I would not like to be asked. Uh, but for the principle that I do not like to really draw that line around conversations, and I wanted this to be as free flowing as it possibly can be, uh, I said, no, let's just have a, a conversation. But now that the question came up, I have to answer. Uh, I'm sorry. So, well, no, no, that's all right. I mean, I, I told you I don't mind. I mean, honestly, I don't mind any questions. It's like, a, uh, in fact, nothing comes that easy when it comes to you know thinking about what you personally might do or not. Uh, you mentioned passion and you know strong feelings and all that. I have that in me for sure, and I had for a long time. I feel very passionate about about issues. I believe in. And and I, and I think it's a good thing, to be honest with you. It's good for the heart and uh, makes you feel younger. Uh, you mentioned something about my former boss being kind of old. I'm not that young either, but uh, passion is good. I mean, you, you need to be passionate about things. I mean, you believe and you know, go out and pursue them. And there is a lot of good energy that, that flows from there in, in, in terms of inspiring you know, people around you. That That's the key component of what you need to do. You asked me, and I never really had this question to answer in this way. I'm, I'm not really dodging it at all. Let me just honestly tell you that it, it never really was on my mind that I would be in a position of leadership in the sense that it's I, I didn't have that feeling when I was doing what I was doing, when what I was doing was done as Fayadism by Thomas Friedman first, I think, and, and that became a, a conversation in, of, in and of itself. Uh, taking on life of its own. I didn't think about it subsequently, and I'm not thinking about it now. Uh, I really actually was asked simply back in 2002 by our late president, Yasser Arafat, to come in and fix the finances of the Palestinian Authority against the backdrop of a lot of calls, many calls for reform, both by you know Palestinians and international community. And I honestly thought that that's what I told my wife at the time. She's like, how long? I said, two years. Uh, and and she's like, why two years? That's a question. You know, two budgets, I think, in terms of budgets, a technocrats. So first, you take the first cut, you fix as much as you fix. And second time around, you kind of fix it. And then you go back to your normal life. And honestly, I, it almost happened this way. Mm -hmm. Because a little bit over two years, I left the PA, not to really do anything with it anymore. Things happened, long story. Bottom line is, I never really thought of myself as the face of the people or anything like that. But uh, Bennett, you except to be in a, a cabinet officer. With something kind of really changes. You can't really think of yourself as a, the accountant. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, you have a prime minister, you have a president, and you have the luxury of kind of really hiding behind them. But you're not going to really achieve much if you did not throw out what you do in public service. You know, kind of uh, project yourself within your own purview and lean, and I'm serious about this, in, in, in a way that inspires people around you. Now, you, people call this leadership. I think it's an it's it's a uh, it goes without saying. It, it, it needs people to really get to move around and to do the, the right thing. They need to be inspired in it, uh, and and you need to really actually relate to people. You need to understand where they're coming from. And I have to tell you that part of it kind of happened. It, it was not the product of design was not of anything. But I really never thought I was going to be that person. I didn't then. I'm not thinking now. And I'll tell you something else more than that. Part of my kind of legacy is uh, anytime, given my own background and the extent to which this is discussed and speculated, anytime there's going to be any government change or anything that all of a sudden I'm subject to a conversation, but he's talking about me. Oh, he's coming back. He's coming back. 
uh, that conversation was never with me. It all the time was about me. Uh, I was not really part of it. Didn't talk about it all the time. There was never a serious conversation about this. I know what we need to do. I have clarity uh, on this. And this has not been uh, uh, challenged in a credible way. We need to unite our policy. We have idea how to do this, a model for it. Does that mean I have to do it myself? No, because I cannot and I will not really impose myself on anyone. Uh, only what we really need now is consensus. And we need elections at some point in time. But that's what that's that's my word. Uh, I never, you know, twice it happened to me. First, when I was asked to join as a minister of finance, uh, without much thinking about it, I did. And I was asked to, well, I served many times as minister of finance. And then when I asked to serve as prime minister, I honestly did not think much about it at the time in terms of the, the enormity of it and all of that. And a sense of the uh, enormous sense of the duty uh, that we have toward the country. Look, we're, I, I mean what I say, uh, and I say, People deserve, you know, the best. That's the essence of what it's about. And if you are ever in a position where you can do that, there can be no higher honor. Uh, actually, to quote the words of the title, the book of your colleague, Rice. Yeah. yeah, no higher honor. If anyone of you gets the opportunity to serve, do and do it with passion as well. What you end up doing or not doing, some people aspire. I'm not, I'm not really looking for a job. I'm quite happy with what I am. Well, thank you all. Please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Salam Fayyad. Thank you.